Stanford University. Industrial decarbonization. So if we look at the greenhouse gas emissions that come from the, the US, this is US data, actually, you'll see in that pie chart on the left that industry, decarb indust industry contributes about 30% of greenhouse gas emissions. We all think about transportation and vehicles, and we think about you know, buildings and so on. But actually, industry is a, is a big contributor. And um, there are about five or six really big areas of industry that um, contribute to, to the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, things like chemicals and refining, um, iron and steel, cement, and so on. And we'll be hearing, when we hear our presentations, we will be hearing about some of the ideas that we're looking at in those particular uh, uh, industries. And the strategies for decarbonizing can be, can be many. Um, some of the ones that are listed here you know, include, well, can we try and go from, from fossil fuels to, fuels to low carbon fuels, things like hydrogen or biofuels in these processes? Can we capture the, the CO2 that comes out? Can we electrify? And we have a big program that we're getting involved with in electrification of processes, and we'll hear uh, about this also, and energy efficiency as well. Um, from the electrification side, actually, if we look at the decarbonization, if we look at um, the carbon emissions from, from these different industries, what you can see on the left, that much of it is, comes from just process heating. And it's really the burning of fossil fuels that are used to heat to get to the temperatures you need for those industrial processes. And so if we can electrify those, then as you can see on the chart on the, the, the right, it, you know, we can probably um, reduce a lot of those CO2 emissions. So that's one of those strategies. So with that sort of introduction, I would like to let you know about our three panelists. We're very lucky to have with us today um, Jen Dion. She's a professor of material science and engineering and by courtesy of uh, radiology at Stanford. She also has other, lots of other responsibilities at Stanford, including being the senior associate vice provost on research platforms and shared facilities. Um, and she'll be talking a lot about some uh, <coughs> nanophotonic work on how she can apply it to, to steel making. Next up, we'll have uh, Jonathan Fan. I'm sorry they're not sitting in the order that's listed here. Um, he's an associate professor of electrical engineering, doing some really exciting work on inductive heating processes that can be applied to um, in industry. And so we'll be hearing about some of the, the new designs of reactors and so on that he is, is looking at. And finally, we have Tiziana Venorio. She's a professor of rock physics and geo materials in the in earth and planetary science. She's also got a courtesy appointment in civil and environmental engineering and in geophysics. And she's got some really exciting ideas about new types of cement, how you can process them, uh, still maintain the right properties, but not have all the CO2 emissions. And so we'll be hearing from these three, these three research approaches that are going on at Stanford in this area. So I am going to stop now and I am going to hand it over to Jen to give the first talk. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you here. Um, a big thanks to the organizers for bringing us all together in May. It's wonderful to have uh, this event, especially um, at the beginnings of the new Door School of Sustainability. So really excited to uh, share some of our work and um, hopefully see a lot of uh, new collaborations that come from uh, this, this symposium. Today, um, I wanted to share with you how our lab is developing new approaches um, to drive sustainable chemical manufacturing, largely using um, out-of-equilibrium chemistry, so developing new um, photocatalysts and new photoelectrocatalysts that can enable new reaction pathways that are not possible with heat alone. And um, you'll see some of the students and postdocs who contributed to this work throughout this presentation. Um, many of them have gone on to now very successful careers, including some faculty at Northwestern, MIT, Berkeley, um, and, and some of the students and postdocs who are contributing are in this room today. So if you don't get a chance to meet me later, hopefully you'll get a chance to chat with them. 
Richard did a wonderful job uh, introducing industrial uh, decarbonization, um, so I don't need to review too much on this slide, but um, looking at some of the plots that Richard showed earlier is what inspired me and my laboratory to think about how we can start decarbonizing many of these processes that relate to chemical manufacturing. And that includes chemical manufacturing of um, things like ethylene, polyethylene, <clears throat> plastics, uh, ammonia for fertilizers and, and food synthesis, um, and also thinking about steel and the construction industry, um, and also single-use uh, consumer products like plastics. And those contribute uh, collectively over 20% of all global greenhouse gas emissions. So there's a you know, big opportunity here to decarbonize industry if we can tackle some of these reactions. And as many of you know, many of these products are made with catalysts, <clears throat> usually small metallic nanoparticles or enzymes um, that can expedite the speed of reactions. Um, but most catalysts operate at very high temperatures and very high pressures. And in my lab, we're very excited to develop new methods to both detect molecules and to direct their transformations and enable new reaction pathways using light. The idea being that light is a sustainable energy resource. You can use, say, solar or wind-driven light-emitting diodes to power um, reactors. And then that opens up new reaction pathways that are not possible when you're in thermal equilibrium and just re relying on heat alone. So I just wanted to put um, this slide up here because um, many of you are probably familiar with catalysts. When we think about inorganic metal nanoparticle catalysts, there are lots of opportunities to draw from the periodic table, but the combinations are almost limitless. Like there are more combinations of you know, metals if you're thinking about bimetallic or multimetallic nanoparticles than there are stars in the universe. <clears throat> And I really like this quote from a paper that came out a few years ago that said, there is currently not enough understanding of how charge carriers move through these diverse inorganic materials to provide rational design principles. So I think if we look at the field of catalysis, it has made amazing strides in the past century, and especially in the past decade, if we think about sustainable chemical manufacturing but yet it's still very hard to come up with both predictive theoretical methods and also insightful experimental methods that allow us to rationally optimize these catalysts for sustainability. So what my lab has focused on is trying to come up with new techniques that allow us to image how these catalysts are interacting with the molecules in their environment with near atomic scale resolution, kind of in situ and in operando. And then based on those insights that we have with certain chemical compositions um, and crystallites of our catalysts, then apply those optimized nanoparticles to our reactor. And if you get a chance, you're welcome to come see our laboratory over in the material science building. Um, we have a bench scale reactor that we can do uh, kind of a smaller scale um, photoelectrochemistry in. Um, and then we also have a really nice transmission electron microscope that allows us to do that atomic scale imaging. And here are four of the reactions that I'll try to share with you um, today. Uh, one is ammonia synthesis. Uh, the second is acetylene hydrogenation to create ethylene, a precursor to polyethylene. Another is CO2 reduction to create high value chemicals. In this case, creating ethylene from just carbon dioxide and water and sustainable light. Um, and then also steel. So in this case, um, doing iron reduction um, to create steel. Um, and you can see that all of these reactions are hydrogenation reactions. So you're using um, either hydrogen or water basically to uh, hydrogenate your reactant to create the product. So a lot of our work to understand these reactions started initially with introducing gases like hydrogen um, into our transmission electron microscope and then seeing how hydrogen interacts with the nanoparticles. And what I'll share with you is that by using light, and in particular light in the form of surface plasmons, you can selectively control how these particles are hydrogenating and how their surface is hydrogenating. So you wind up basically being able to control how the, how the hydrogen is bonded to the surface. Here's a picture of actually a somewhat older transmission electron microscope. We have a, now have a newer one. It's fun to see people next to it because our newer transmission electron microscope is uh, almost as tall as some of the uh, Baytown Exxon reactors that we got to tour. Like, uh, you know, it's uh, several human heights tall, but it allows us to get really unprecedented resolution of these catalytic reactions and to correlate how the reaction is occurring with the three dimensional atomic scale structure. And in our transmission electron microscope, we use the electrons, obviously, for imaging. 
and then we can introduce those gaseous environments, and then we can do things like turn up the temperature and actually access industrial scale temperatures to look at just conventional thermal catalysis. We can also apply an electrical bias, so we can look at electrocatalysis. Um, we can cool the sample if we want to slow the kinetics down. Um, and then we can also introduce light um, into the transmission electron microscope and also couple light out if we want to look at spectroscopic uh, properties. So when we're illuminating a metal nanoparticle, many of the catalysts that we work with actually support optical resonances. And even if we're not used to thinking about those optical resonances, maybe they occur at slightly different wavelengths, they exist. They're especially strong in a lot of the coinage metals. So um, silver, gold, copper, um, they all support very strong surface plasmon resonances, but even platinum, palladium, uh, those are typical catalytic materials. They also support plasmon resonances. Um, and when I mean, pla or when I say plasmon resonance, I mean a collective oscillation of the conduction electron. So as long as your catalyst has some conduction electrons in it, when you illuminate it with light, those conduction electrons are going to start to move in response to the driving electromagnetic field of light. <clears throat> and their motion will be dictated by the local structure of your catalyst. So if you think about what we're used to controlling in thermal catalysis, it's the gas pressure, or the temperature, or maybe electrical potentials, those occur on scales much, much larger than the catalyst particle itself. But the neat thing about using light and tailoring the nanoparticle in such a way where you can control that light matter interaction is that you can control what the electrons are doing on a length scale that is smaller than the catalyst itself. And here are just some examples showing how plasmon resonances in materials like palladium and silver that have been um, colloidally uh, you know, hybridized or basically mixed together into a bimetallic catalyst um, allow you to tune both the optical properties of the catalyst. So here you can see spectrally the color of the catalyst is changing as you go from one weight percent palladium in, say, a silver nanoparticle up to 90 weight percent in a bimetallic nanoparticle. And then also when we experimentally map the resonances at different wavelengths, you can see that this particular bimetallic nanoparticle has resonances at um, a three electron volt excitation that occur at the tips of the nanoparticle. So that means you're getting electrons selectively at the tips of this particular nanoparticle. But if you change the wavelength of illumination, now you can see your electrons are kind of localized near the edges of your catalytic nanoparticle. And without going through roughly a decade's worth of work, I just want to share with you two videos that kind of highlight uh, some of the results. So if you're working with surface plasmons, and here we just have this simple prism particle to more clearly illustrate what's happening. If you're in the dark and just working in thermal equilibrium, here we're looking at a hydrogenation reaction and kind of that phase contrast you're seeing is where the particle is being hydrogenated. You can see there's a phase front that's kind of moving across the nanoparticle. It started from this tip all the way on the right-hand side of the slide and then moved across the nanoparticle. But when we illuminate on resonance, and in this particular nanoparticle, the resonance is actually localized down in this corner, you'll see the reaction actually occurs down here at that corner and then happens in about um, 10x the speed um, of in the dark. And you also saw that the phase front didn't split up at the very end. So I'll play each of these videos just one more time as one illustrative example, but um, there are many publications um, from our lab to kind of illustrate how light uh, basically gives you this on-demand control um, of the hydrogenation properties of a variety of catalysts. <clears throat> Easiest to see in these <clears throat> prism particles, but we've done it in everything from two nanometer bimetallic nanoparticles um, uh, across a range of uh, compositions, crystallinities, um, all the way up to hundreds of nanometer nanoparticles. Okay, so how do we take what we learn from the TEM where we can do atomic scale structure function correlations into an ensemble scale reactor? Well, in the TEM, usually we disperse our catalytic nanoparticles on a transparent substrate or an electron transparent substrate. When we're in the reactor, um, usually we put them on an alumina um, support. And then uh, we have built um, a fully automated bench scale reactor. Um, here's a QR code if any of you have a reactor that um, includes you know, gas temperature control um, and either a mass spec or a GC output. Um, there's open source code. We call it Catalyte. Um, it allows us to run many reactions uh, essentially while students are you know, on vacation. I am kidding. They are working hard analyzing their data. Um, but um, just the number of reactions that we can run through now is orders of magnitude higher um, than it was before we had this automated system. 
And just in the final four minutes I have, I want to highlight a couple um, examples um, of reactions. So I said we have four reactions that we've looked at, ammonia synthesis, um, acetylene hydrogenation, um, steel, and also uh, CO2 reduction to high value chemicals. So here is um, a gold ruthenium catalyst um, for ammonia synthesis. Um, and ammonia synthesis is an exothermic reaction. It's thermodynamically unfavorable at higher temperatures, um, but it's actually kinetically favorable under high temperatures and high pressures. And we need ammonia to create the fertilizers that feed um, over half the world. So in this particular case, what we did is basically um, swap out the typical iron that's used in ammonia synthesis in the Haber-Bosch process for gold as a plasmonic material while being able to control the amount of ruthenium that's in the catalyst. Um, and then um, you can see that these nanoparticles support um, optical resonances that occur at visible wavelengths, in this case around 500 nanometers or so. And when we compare the reaction in the dark versus a reaction under illumination for different compositions of our catalyst, you can see there are slightly different <clears throat> properties. So here, when we're illuminating, we just have one sun illumination, we're at room temperature and room pressure. And if we compare basically on um, these two different compositions, you can see the thermal reaction rate increases with temperature and with ruthenium content. Um, and that's because ruthenium is basically the active component for the ammonia synthesis. But when we're under illumination at room temperature and pressure, both of these um, nanoparticles exhibit basically twice the reactivity under illumination. And then as you increase basically the amount of ruthenium content here going up to about 30% ruthenium in our catalyst, you can see that um, the high ruthenium content actually lowers the photocatalytic reactivity um, because it compromises the optical property. So there's a nice opportunity to basically play with not only the electronic properties of these bimetallic particles, but also their optical properties. And then what we can do is use an IR camera to basically assess the temperature of the reaction. And what we find is that light, even though we have these electromagnetic hotspots that provide site selectivity and are controlling the hydrogen, it's not actually heating up the catalyst that much. Actually, the temperature is remaining lower. So um, by monitoring the temperature, we can infer that it's a hot carrier or an electron-driven process. And then we're also able to use in-situ FTIR to actually monitor which absorbates are changing. Um, so in this particular case, it's actually the NHX hydrogenation steps that are tailored with light. So here we're zooming into the FTIR spectra where we've monitored the vibrational modes of the absorbates. And basically with illumination, what we're able to tailor is the amount of hydrogen that's coming basically off the surface of the catalyst and onto the um, nitrogen that has adsorbed. In acetylene hydrogenation, um, here this is a super interesting reaction where we're not necessarily looking for kind of expediting the reaction or opening up new hydrogenation steps that are generally challenging. But in this particular case, there are two products and you actually want to have selectivity for um, uh, ethylene as opposed to uh, ethane. And my former postdoc, Dane Swearer, now a professor at Northwestern, showed that with thermal catalysis, basically you have um, an increasing yield, but then a drop off in selectivity as you increase the temperature in some of these bimetallic catalysts. But with photocatalysis, you basically open up new reaction pathways that allow you to overcome that trade off between selectivity and conversion. So in this particular case, he was able to get high yield and also high selectivity as he increased the illumination. And then for steel manufacturing, I've been working very closely with my colleagues, Leora Dresselho Dresselhaus, uh, Zhao Ling Zhen, and Felipe Hornada. Um, and Leora is really a pioneer in, in the steel space. Um, <clears throat> her and I had a pre-court project, uh, a seed funding project that um, uh, started about a year and a half ago. And the idea was instead of using um, uh, carbon monoxide, instead basically use uh, the CO2 exhaust um, to generate hydrogen and then enable kind of direct iron um, or direct reduction of iron via the hydrogen that comes from using basically the top CO2 exhaust. So this is an uphill reaction, but what we found using some of our TEM studies is that even though it's an uphill reaction when we're illuminating with light, um, here you can actually directly see the creation of those steel nanoparticles just with illumination. So you're able to overcome that energy barrier in an exothermic reaction. 
And then as the final example of a new project that's kicking off with my postdoc, I'm Alex Al-Zubedi. Um, we're very excited to make high-value chemicals from uh, carbon dioxide and water. Um, here the idea is to create hydrocarbons from direct air capture, water, and excess renewable electricity. And he's been working with catalysts that are copper. Um, so copper is actually an extremely good uh, material for electrocatalysis, but it's also a great plasmonic material. So can we use those free conduction electrons that we can generate and control with light to be able to more selectively and more efficiently create um, acetylene? Um, and so far, he's had um, some pretty promising results in his gas diffusion electrode, um, where he has 43% conversion of carbon dioxide. Um, and the selectivity break breakdown right now is about 26% for ethylene. Um, you can see there's quite a bit of carbon monoxide that's being generated. Copper is actually not selective for carbon monoxide, but basically what we're doing now is kind of optimizing the amount of copper catalyst that is on our gas diffusion electrode, because basically it's our carbon support that's creating that carbon monoxide. So I think this could be a really promising modular technology for creating high value chemicals from carbon dioxide. So as we're coming to the end, I just wanted to share with you some of the more fundamental research directions that folks um, in my lab and also at Stanford more broadly are working on. That includes coming up with a predictive microscopic theory of photocatalysis and plasmon catalysis when you're dealing with these out of equilibrium reactions and with catalytic nanoparticles that have thousands of nanoparticles. The compute power is still trying to you know, catch up so that way these calculations can be tractable. But my colleague Felipe Hornada has come up with some really exciting advances. I guess now the lights are going off. We talk too much about photocatalysis. <laughs> Um, and then finally, I'm really excited about this ability to link atomic and molecular scale properties to reactor performance. Um, what we have to do, though, is, is connect each of those length scales. It's exciting to think about how we can optimize what's happening on an individual catalyst level. But of course, in a reactor, you have interactions between catalysts as well. And I think we're starting to get to the point where we have in situ techniques that allow us to link those intermediate length scales. So if you want to read more, uh, there's a Physics Today article that is somewhat accessible, um, came out earlier this year um, on nanophotonics and plasmonics. And um, in memory of uh, actually one of my plasmonic heroes, Mark Stockman, and uh, John and I actually grew up kind of in the same community. So I imagine John knew him well. He passed away, unfortunately, a few years ago. But um, he had written one of the first Physics Today's article on the power of light and, and nanophotonics and plasmonics. So with that, I'll wrap up and, and say I personally think a lot of these out of equilibrium reactions offer the light stuff for catalysis. And out of equilibrium, broadly speaking, it can be photonics. It can be um, maybe plasma enhanced reactors. It could be photoelectrocatalysis. Um, but I gave you a, a sampling of the, the four reactions that we're working on and how we're trying to optimize those for sustainable chemical manufacturing by linking atomic to reactor scale properties. So thanks to all of you for your attention. <clears throat> Quick questions for Jen. Yes. A quick one. Um, is your work tied in or related in any way to the, uh, I know the acronym is LISA. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, my advisor was Harry Atwater. Oh, okay. So, okay. yep, okay. yep, exactly. I know you were working on that actively. Yeah, the liquid sunlight allowance. So, uh, I, I am not officially a PI on that, but we have a lot of tangential collaboration. So, it got started kind of a little bit before we were going full into catalysis, but uh, we collaborate quite closely with him and the LISA team. OK, thanks, Jen. Thank you. OK, next up is uh, John Fan, And he will be talking about some of his uh, inductive heating reactors. All right, well, thank you so much for uh, coming. And thank you to Richard and the rest of the organizers for putting together this incredible event. And I want to tell you some of the work that we're doing in the realm of uh, thermochemistry. Um, before I begin, I want to uh, first uh, acknowledge my team. The work I will be showing is incredibly interdisciplinary, where we work very closely with other faculty who specialize in uh, chemistry, chemical engineering, and power electronics. And the students who work on this are essentially from uh, uh, just about every engineering department, except bioengineering. At some point, we'll have to uh, fold them in. Uh, so uh, as Richard show, and I suppose we uh, read the same articles, this is the exact same <laughs> pie chart. Uh, 
you know, industrial decarbonization is a really huge deal, and that's why we're all here in this room. And part of why it is considered one of the hardest to decarbonize uh, sectors is because we're not just trying to decarbonize one process, we're actually trying to decarbonize thousands of processes. And in order to address this, we really need all hands on deck uh, to innovate at every scale with every type of technology. We just saw an incredible talk on breakthroughs in photocatalysis. Those will be needed. Uh, breakthroughs, continued breakthroughs in electrochemistry, uh, which, which, uh, for which there's been a, a huge amount of progress over the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, I will be talking about thermochemistry and hopefully convincing you that even though this appears to be uh, an extremely mature area of technological development, there are actually new uh, ways to think about this field and, and that this field needs to undergo reinvention if we really want to think about this in the context of decarbonization. And that this is uh, something that we have to think about both in terms of the uh, thermochemical technology and also the thermochemical catalyst. In, therm in terms of the reactor technology, uh, uh, the focus that I will be uh, uh, having here is on the electrification of heat uh, for new and existing thermochemistry processes. Uh, when I started out in this area a few years ago, we mostly thought about this as a, a near-term solution uh, for decarbonizing industrial processes, but especially when we think about processes at scale, I believe this also uh, can and will be a long-term uh, solution. Uh, Jen mentioned the Exxon Baytown uh, 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 reactor sizes. Actually, all of us on the panel and, and Richard visited Exxon Baytown, and here's a picture. And I think Jen put it the best way. When we drove around there, it was like being in Mad Max. I still remember you saying that, uh, where in about an hour, we drove around a small fraction of this uh, facility in about, you know, 100 degree heat. Um, the bus was, was uh, air conditioned, thank God. <laughs> But to say that if we're talking about producing commodities at scale for 8 billion people, uh, what this facility showed and what any you know, first chapter of an undergrad chemie textbook would say is your reactor has to be meters to stories in size. There's just no way around this. And that ultimately when we think about thermal chemistry compared to many other methods for uh, chemical conversion, it is an intrinsically three-dimensional technology uh, that can utilize the economy of scale to produce and utilize hundreds of megawatts to gigawatts uh, uh, just in terms of heat of enthalpy in order to perform chemical conversion at scale. And uh, this is absolutely something uh, together with all of the mature catalysis and waste heat utilization uh, and, and uh, management uh, that, that we can and should uh, uh, utilize even when we start thinking about uh, decarbonization. Uh, the second is that we should uh, and need to think about processing with, uh, you know, thermochemistry and other uh, methods, uh, new carbon feedstocks. I think uh, Jen showed some, some examples as well for uh, CO2 utilization. But as we start thinking about utilizing uh, feedstocks other than fossil fuels, uh, biomass, biogas, CO2, uh, we need to ultimately adapt our infrastructure towards these new feedstocks. Uh, my collaborator, Matt Cannon, has uh, for the reverse wire gas shift reaction, which is a CO2 utilization reaction, um, has developed a new amorphous alkali carbonate catalyst. Uh, this is an incredible catalyst that not only has uh, a very clear technological benefits, such as the suppressing of competing Sabatier methanation reactions, which means that this is a catalyst that can uh, operate at thermal dynamic conversion uh, with no side reactions at intermediate temperatures. Uh, but it's incredibly cheap. It is uh, much, much cheaper than catalysts based on, on nickel or other types of metals, and, and it uses earth abundant materials. And, and, and so this is just as important uh, to think about as we think about decarbonizing uh, uh, many areas in the chemical industry. Now, if you uh, woke up and had breakfast, uh, you are probably a practitioner and expert of electrified heating technology. Uh, you well know in your kitchen that there are uh, many different types of heating technologies and that uh, many of these are very well developed. And the question then comes, you know, is, is, is there actually something new to be done here? And uh, which one of these, you know, should we start thinking about as we uh, create a foundation for a new type of reactor technology? And from my point of view, the real opportunity is to, uh, 
is to develop concepts at the interface of electrical and chemical engineering uh, where we are really looking to co-design the electrified heating process with chemical reaction engineering to enhance performance. And this includes, for example, reducing the form factor of the reactor, uh, simplifying the overall refinery, uh, and, and, and pushing for even higher conversions. And, and this really is necessary because, as everyone here knows, everything is driven by economics. And, uh, and in order to uh, begin to compete in the short term with the combustion of fossil fuels for thermal chemistry, uh, we really have to add something new to the table. For various reasons, uh, many of which will become apparent for the rest of the talk, we will focus on uh, magnetic induction. It is a uh, truly scalable technology that, at least in the metallurgy industry, um, has been demonstrated to scale to tens of megawatts and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and to reactor sizes that are on the order of, of a meter or greater. So, so we see this as kind of a, a good starting point for thinking about uh, thermal chemistry at scale in the uh, in the chemical space, um, but clearly it's 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 an area that uh, even though it has been developed in metallurgy, adapting this to to uh, say gas reforming uh, reactions is still uh, a, a very nascent area. Uh, when we think about inductive heating, some of you may not know it's actually uh, you know not exactly the most. Uh, uh, completely well understood concept, you know, especially as we do think about applying this to, to something like gas reforming. And the reason is because there are uh, still some challenges in efficiency uh, compared to, for example, uh, uh, electrified uh, uh, resistive heating, which is, you know, in the case of a light bulb, extremely efficient at producing heat. With magnetic induction, uh, we essentially have the issue of the fact that we are driving a current through a magnetic coil to produce a magnetic field uh, that couples to our uh, susceptor. In our case, this is a reactor. And the fact that we are driving a current through the coil means some of that uh, current will actually dissipate as heat itself uh, before uh, converting in into magnetic fields. And, and so uh, just, just maybe the key thing is, is this uh, plot showing that uh, if we're attempting to um, inductively heat a graphite cylinder with a helical coil. It actually turns out to be a very inefficient process. Most of your heat actually is dissipated in the uh, coils themselves, and, uh, and this, of course, is very problematic. This is something that is accepted for a lot of metallurgy applications where uh, you know, selective heating or tempering of metal uh, is, is worth the cost of, of heat loss. But if we're looking to really adapt this uh, to, to concepts in the energy space, we have to have something that is uh, just about as efficient as resistive heating. So the question then is, uh, you know, what, what can we do here? And, uh, and this is where we can, we can and should start thinking about uh, the reactor as an artificial electromagnetic medium. So, so to, to uh, help motivate this, I'm going to start with the idea that uh, if we have a, a graphite susceptor, uh, solid material, uh, this is the type of um, heating efficiency that we have. If we reduce the conductivity of the susceptor by one order of magnitude, we will actually find that the heating efficiency will go up and shift to higher frequencies. And if we continue to reduce the uh, conductivity of, of the um, susceptor material, uh, we, this trend can actually continue, where if we continue to reduce this by orders of magnitude, uh, we can actually have at very high frequencies, in this case megahertz frequencies, that the heating efficiencies are well over uh, 90%. This is to say that the vast majority of energy inputted into the system is going into internal heating as opposed to, uh, as opposed to heating of the uh, coil in a parasitic way. This is uh, quite, I, I would say, uh, for electrical engineers, counterintuitive because typically when we think about going to higher frequencies, uh, anyone in power electronics knows that that means you have higher loss because of so-called skin depth effects. Uh, uh, this is to say energy dissipation in the coil generally should go higher. And, and this is correct as we see the impedance of a coil increasing as the square root of frequency. But the key here is that if we are in a volumetric heating regime for the susceptor, uh, the heating of the susceptor will actually scale as frequency, and this is where we can actually get a win by going to higher frequencies. So this is the key. 
uh, we want to do two things. We want to reduce the uh, conductivity of the uh, reactor material, uh, uh, orders of magnitude compared to, uh, in this case, graphite. And we want to perform induction heating at uh, very high frequencies. Uh, for the first part, we are going to focus on, on uh, essentially uh, using both intrinsic material properties and extrinsic geometric structuring in order to achieve a material that has an effective uh, conductivity that matches what we want. This means, in our case, finding materials that have uh, intrinsically low conductivity. In our case, we are focusing on uh, silicon carbide and other types of conductive ceramics, in part because of its low conductivity and also because it is an excellent reactor material from the point of view of, of, of uh, hardness and ability to adapt with, with existing reactor infrastructure. Uh, but the key here is we're additionally going to geometrically structure uh, the, uh, the material. Of course, in the reactor, we're not going to have just a solid material, but we're going to actually have a highly porous material that is 90% or more um, air. And in fact, through geometric structuring, uh, we can have a structure with an effective thermal conductivity that can be uh, calculated using basic effective medium uh, approximations. So this is the key and why we term these reactors metamaterial reactors is because we are now thinking about the reactor baffle as a material with, a, with geometric properties that we can essentially tune in order to produce uh, uh, reaction engineered properties uh, such as heating efficiency, but also heat transfer uh, that can really uh, break through a lot of existing uh, 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 limits to, to conventional thermal chemical reactor uh, uh, designs. So this is what our uh, reactors uh, look like without thermal insulation, where we have here uh, silicon carbide baffles that are infiltrated with catalysts um, and for which the induction heating of these type of uh, infiltrated fixed bed catalysts in, in baffle structures uh, are able to uh, produce enhanced heat transfer, mass transfer, and pressure drop properties uh, that, that ultimately allow us to reduce the size and form factor of these reactors down. Depending on the uh, reactor size uh, or depending on the reaction, we're talking about reductions on the order of, of, of an order of magnitude or more. Uh, so through this, uh, through this uh, uh, project, we have essentially been designing reactors from scratch. Uh, this includes uh, the reactor setup itself. This includes building the power electronics ourselves. I think in understanding that uh, you know, very high frequencies are required, I think it's extremely exciting that kind of tangentially a, a big push in power electronics has been actually to utilize high wide band gap uh, semiconductors to push the frequency of power electronics higher and higher to megahertz frequencies, which is exactly what we need and which my colleague Juan Rivas specializes in. Uh, we've done a huge amount of, of heating analysis of, of these systems to, to confirm that they do indeed operate in ideal uh, plug flow uh, uh, type conditions and uh, an examination of our reaction results indicate that we are able to uh, essentially convert uh, uh, CO2 to CO uh, near thermodynamic limits within, with a wall plug electricity to internal uh, heating efficiency of uh, nearly 90%. Um, again, when we talk about thermochemical reactors and also when we talk about induction, uh, the real key uh, from my point of view is the benefits in reactor scaling, that everything just gets better and better as we scale to larger and larger sizes, because at the end we do want to go uh, to megawatts and beyond. Uh, th these uh, plots up here show using our experimental data that as we uh, essentially increase the temperature or the gas flow, the efficiency of the reactor at utilizing uh, wall plug electricity uh, to gas heating and the reaction uh, increases uh, accordingly. And that also uh, reactor size scaling naturally enhances operating efficiencies. And this is due to the fact that uh, heat loss uh, in the coil and due to uh, heat loss uh, from the reactor walls uh, scales uh, differently than the uh, scaling of, 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 of uh, gas heating and, and the reaction. And, and that we believe that we can 
uh, ultimately get uh, 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 efficiencies that, that basically um, are, are solely limited by uh, heat exchanger technology within the reactor and uh, due to the power electronics efficiency, which is a limit to any type of, of electrified uh, uh, system. So to summarize, um, I think we are, uh, you know, kind of scratching the surface of, of what I think are, are topics in electrified reaction engineering, which is really a concept for which metamaterial reactors are part of, where we're lo really looking to co-design uh, concepts in electrification with chemical reactor technologies. Uh, this is distinct, and I would say complementary to uh, taking the best of electrified technologies with the best of existing uh, thermochemical technologies, uh, where retrofitting is going to be a huge part of decarbonizing industry, right? Getting electrified boilers, using uh, 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 heat batteries uh, based on electrification. And, uh, but if we're ultimately looking to create new types of chemical infrastructure from scratch, uh, where we are looking to have something that is basically operating at the limits of, of uh, thermochemical uh, 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 performance and reactor form factor, I, I think the level of control that we have through electrification and our ability to push uh, beyond existing uh, uh, artificial limits in, in heat transfer in particular uh, are going to really uh, lead to uh, really new classes of, of electrified form factors. And, and ultimately, as economics is driving the adoption of new technologies, that when we look at capital costs, having uh, much smaller reactor technologies that still essentially are buckets of balls uh, in terms of large uh, you know, buckets of catalysts, uh, together with the fact that we can operate so incredibly efficiently uh, with the utilization of electricity, uh, will make this economically uh, competitive. I think we're doing a lot of really detailed uh, techno-economics analyses, so we'll get some numbers out for that sometime uh, soon. And, and that, you know, the time really is now. The last thing I'll just say is something everyone knows. Uh, the IPCC recommends a net zero carbon emissions economy by 2050. Um, however, talking to the Exxon folks and, and others, um, it takes a good, you know, 15 to 20 years to actually scale anything up from a new concept to, to something commercial, assuming that someone actually wants to do that and, and pay for it. And so actually, it turns out that uh, directions, research in the next uh, five to ten years is going to uh, basically set the agenda for what can be scaled uh, by 2050. And I, I think that's where, uh, for our approaches, thinking about uh, uh, thermochemical reactors, uh, leveraging a lot of what we already have, but in analyzing these reactors as an artificial uh, electromagnetic uh, medium in order to really tailor reactions. I, I think these are uh, concepts that, that have a chance to scale in, in uh, these type of, of times. So uh, I want to really thank my uh, sponsors. I've been uh, incredibly fortunate to, to, uh, uh, to, to work with a number of entities internal to Stanford and also um, outside uh, a number of, of uh, companies. And, uh, and uh, yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you, John. Any question for, for John? Yes, over here. Hi, uh, th thank you very much for the really interesting topic. Um, so I have a question about, uh, I I'm a material scientist, and uh, so obviously I think to do inductive heating, you would need some magnetic properties in your materials, and um, does that put a limit to, for example, the thermal uh, properties of the materials? I, I would assume for these purposes you want to go through very high temperatures, and those thermal properties might be very important. So is that Absolutely. Issue? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think um, uh, th this is a great question because I think there's often the conception that materials need to be magnetic in order to be magnetically inductively heated. And uh, there are certainly ways to heat magnetic materials through hysteresis, uh, which, which are really, really interesting, actually, for the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a lot of literature on heating magnetic nanoparticles, for example, specifically because they are magnetic. Um, but that in our case, uh, we are uh, 
you, you can magnetically, uh, you, you can magnetically inductively heat materials that are uh, simply electrically conductive through uh, eddy current effects. And in our case, we're not using any magnetic materials. We're simply using silicon carbide that is sufficiently electrically conductive as to be able to heat it, be heated. But last one. Last one, then we should move on. Yeah, I've got a question about the power electronics and how scalable is it to the megawatt scale? Yeah. And how adaptable is it to um, medium voltage grid? Because when you're talking about megawatt scales, you're really talking about medium voltages. Right, I, absolutely. I think um, uh, there's a lot more to, to say uh, than, than, you know, maybe a 10 second response, but to say, I think, you know, going up to about a megawatt, uh, there are. Uh, entities attempting to push, you know, wide band gap uh, semiconductor power electronics uh, towards those scales. But that ultimately, as you start thinking about scaling these type of systems, there are going to be some uh, interesting design trade-offs where ultimately you may want to still utilize for very large systems silicon switches, but that through the process of sub-pilot and pilot and, and actually making sure that the uh, reaction engineering works, uh, you, you may want to focus on uh, higher frequencies. I don't think we are looking to replace existing reactor and refinery infrastructure, but that through this process of, of inductive heating, when we are looking to ultimately deploy new reactor technology, um, which will have to happen just given the nature of renewable feedstocks, uh, this will lead to dramatic simplifications in, for example, uh, heating and heat exchange uh, you know, it's not just reducing the reactor size, but, but I believe it will involve reducing the refinery size. And, and to understand that, you just have to understand all of the processes and to understand the infrastructure that goes into um, heating and waste heat recovery, which is part of the reason why existing refineries are so large. So I'm very excited <clears throat> today <clears throat> in uh, um, presenting the latest development in our um, geomimetic cement uh, technology. Um, it's a technology where we are harnessing the power of the composition and also structure of some um, rock um, cement with the idea of creating uh, new cement that is uh, that does not emit um, as much or it's low carbon uh, emission cement uh, formulation and also uh, has better properties with respect to Portland um, cement. I'd like to start with uh, uh, the team. Uh, this is a geoscience and engineering partnership. I'm a geophysicist and I'm, I'm a geoscientist, uh, specifically a rock physicist. And uh, these are my partners in crime, Alberto from, uh, and Matteo from uh, uh, the School of Engineering, uh, and then all the students and postdoc who have been working very hard uh, in, in over the last uh, two years, funded by uh, Procourt, uh, to help us to put this uh, together. Krish is an MBA who is helping um, us to uh, look at the techno-economic analysis of this uh, technology, Hamed looking at the uh, wellbore cement and uh, all the others who have been working on the nano-characterization and uh, the mechanical properties like Davide and uh, Jorge. Just to be on the same uh, page, cement is the glue of uh, concrete and is an aluminosilicate. We all know that cement technology, cement manufacturing, it, uh, is one of the big, uh, uh, biggest uh, emitter uh, of CO2. But there is also another uh, problem. The manufacturing chain is highly uh, inefficient. I mentioned that uh, cement is a calcium-rich aluminosilicate. In order to make cement, we need basically three rocks. We need sand and clay. We need carbonate rocks. Mix them together. <clears throat> And carbonate rock is the rock that is uh, responsible for uh, the uh, emission. Because of this mixing, we need in the manufacturing chain proportioning equipment just to make the right uh, mix and also preheater, uh, which uh, goes before uh, the kiln, just to uh, remove uh, the, uh, the CO2 and keep uh, the reaction uh, going. But emission is only one 
um, uh, problem. Uh, it's not just bad for the environment, but it's also um, uh, bad in terms of uh, cost. Because we have to think that during calcination, 38% of the weight of transported rock is emitted of CO2. So it's not just emissions bad for the environment, but it's also a matter of um, cost. For, for this reason, we have been working with a new blend which is, uh, uh, that comes from volcanic rocks. By definition, volcanic rocks cannot have the, C the carbon ion because Earth already cooked uh, those rocks. And this is a, a, a comparison between the emission or the mass uh, loss that comes from the use of limestone uh, compare, so it's 40% mass loss, the limestone uh, alone, uh, compared to less than 2% uh, 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 of mass loss that comes from a volcanic blend. So this means, this uh, lower mass loss means higher throughput, which will become very important when we start analyzing uh, costs. Uh, the manufacturing chain compared to Portland cement uh, is also simpler because we will not be, uh, with the use of this volcanic blend, we will not be uh, uh, in need anymore. Uh, neither the, the, um, uh, the mixer uh, that uh, I mentioned in the, in the manufacturing chain, nor uh, the, uh, pre -cal the, the calciner uh, the, um, that is before the kiln. But then it's not too disrupting uh, the technology with respect to the manufacturing chain because we will still need to quarry uh, uh, rocks, calcining uh, the, the rock, grinding, and then cooling and shipping. So in terms of composition, the cement that we are working on sits in between Portland-based cement, so calcium-rich um, cement, and alkali-activated and geopolymer. So it has a calcalkaline uh, composition. And the, the, the goal here is really to get the best of the two worlds. We get the, the best strength and due to the presence of calcium-rich uh, cementitious um, uh, materials, and then uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the ability to resist to um, acids, corrosion, that is typical of alkali-activated cements and uh, uh, geopolymers. The other thing that we are doing, uh, the goal of this project was not just to have a low carbon composition. Low carbon composition is not, uh, is not the uh, only drive here. We want cement to last. And so for this reason, we are also growing, and I emphasize growing, not adding, fibers within our material with the goal of braiding them, intertwine uh, them, because these are, uh, this is how uh, the cement of folds. Uh, it's very ironic. As a geoscientist, I don't want the cement of fold to be um, um, or be rich of these fibers that are intertwined, because this will provide the rock and so in the fold with a lot of ductility and uh, strain energy uh, accumulation, which we don't want for rocks, but we want this for uh, materials. So we are uh, great, uh, growing these fibers, and uh, we have been growing these fibers uh, in, in, in a way that they are intertwined, the same physics that comes from the physics of the rope, where uh, fibers are intertwined, they're braided to make yarns and uh, strands. I love in particular this uh, picture because you will see that fibers that we grow really sprout for, from this um, cementitious uh, material that make, uh, and the fibers literally sprouting from this cementitious formulation uh, give this inorganic material, at least in my opinion, the appearance of a living uh, creature and yet is uh, inorganic. But the other reason why I love this picture is because here is the cartoon Cartoon. Probably Richard may remember this is the cartoon that we had in mind when we submitted have our proposal uh, three years uh, ago, and and uh, and I can say that uh, um, uh, we made it, and this is really uh, something we were very um, happy about. The formulation. Um, our cement is naturally white compared to uh, OPC. It's not just because 
white cement is slick, is, is uh, um, um, also uh, loved by architects, but we are also, the next step is also to understand the reflectivity and understand whether uh, this will be a good um, uh, uh, material for construction and so natural uh, cooling system. But let's look at the properties. So uh, this is a plot of stress with respect to uh, strain. Um, this are uh, the stress at failure for normal weight and light weight. So it's about 50, uh, 46 and uh, 76 um, um, strength uh, at failure after 28 days of uh, uh, curing. Uh, and this is the comparison with Portland um, cement uh, with the same cement water ratio, 0 0.45, after um, um, 28 days, um, uh, at least the light weight uh, reaches 46, and so it's uh, better with respect to cement. We also are interested not only in strength, but also the ductility of the material. And this is something that I will talk in this next uh, slide. First of all, I want to focus on the uh, graph on the left. Uh, we are not just focusing on this new technology and, and thinking of using this as a cement, but also as a supplementary cementitious material. What if we blend our material with current uh, Portland cement? And so you can see here a series of tests uh, that have been uh, made uh, as a function of the percentage of replacement. Um, so the, the the replacement of a PC is in, uh, decreasing, sorry, it's decreasing, the amount of a PC is uh, decreasing uh, uh, this way. So here is high OPC content and this is uh, low uh, uh, OPC content. And I have to say that the highest uh, replacement, so 60% of replacement, still has uh, good strength after 28 uh, days. I want to remind uh, everyone that the minimum strength after 20 days of uh, curing uh, based on ASTM and also uh, API, which is the cement for weld bore, is 30 NPA. So we are definitely exceeding. But in the previous slide and also this one, you will see a lot of strain and this is very uh, important. So I'm going to zoom in and you will see here a beautiful fracture um, cement sample where the fracture, and I never seen this in most of the uh, rocks or in uh, over my career, where the fracture is really meandering. Uh, generally, if you have something that fails catastrophically and is brittle, the fracture is clean and straight. But this is uh, uh, meandering, and you can see that there are fibers uh, here. This is well known in engineering, less in, uh, uh, in geoscience, but this is where um, uh, fibers are present and are bridging uh, the cracks, so uh, preventing the cracks from opening. This is where the presence of fibers is deflecting the, the path of the, the crack, and this is where a group of fibers actually stop uh, the cracks. And this provides ductility uh, to uh, the material. Uh, here are more uh, and more really cool uh, SEM images of fibers bridging the cracks and so preventing uh, the cracks from opening. And I want to uh, draw the attention uh, to the scale here. This is 500 uh, nanometers. This is also an example of samples after uh, failure. Uh, and, and so this is a testament to the ductility. Uh, samples still hold together. Fractures do not open uh, up. And so uh, this is due to the presence of uh, fibers that naturally grow into uh, the, the, um, uh, the sample. And I want to mention for those who are not familiar, normally in engineering, people have been adding fibers to materials to increase the ductility and the performance, but adding fibers is not, it's very different from growing fibers. And this is because growing fibers allows to have the best match and the chemical affinity between the fibers and the matrix and prevent what is well known, uh, it's uh, known as uh, uh, debonding and fiber pullout, uh, which then is responsible for uh, failure. Okay, 
everything from the science perspective uh, looks great, but what about costs? So I will uh, focus first on the environmental um, saving and then the cost saving. So here, uh, there is a comparison between uh, our formulation and OPC in terms of CO2, and here I'm just focusing on the emission of CO2 that comes from the calcination only. I'm not talking about the use of energy. Uh, we can also talk about uh, this um, if you have questions. So here is just the reaction, the calcination. And so here we see that one ton of a PC um, uh, well uh, emits um, actually uh, um, 500, um, almost uh, 500 kilos of uh, um, CO2, while uh, with the new formulation we have 130 uh, kilograms. So we have a saving uh, more or less of 74%, and here I'm, I'm focusing on one specific formulation, the one that I uh, refer, uh, I show the, the mechanical uh, properties. In terms of a cost, there are some savings due to mainly the fact that there is a higher throughput. Everything that we quarry will be transformed into um, um, cement because we don't have 30% of loss uh, of, uh, in terms of CO2. There is also saving in terms of uh, electricity, uh, labor, because the, the manufacturing chain uh, becomes um, simpler uh, and also uh, fuel. Where are those rocks? Those rocks are everywhere. They are in five continents. And so at the moment, we are working uh, on refining on this. This is a map uh, that um, we created. Um, and uh, the, the, the presence of these rocks uh, is constrained on this map. Um, uh, the, the constraint here while building this map was how far are current cement plants. And so uh, we are um, mapping here only those rocks that sit uh, um, below the presence of current um, cement plants. Uh, this is just an example uh, in the United States. There is plenty, those rocks are present in all five continents and uh, uh, most importantly also in um, South America. So where are we at the moment? These are the achieved targets uh, thanks to the support um, through uh, the uh, Precourt uh, Institutes. Uh, we have a, a low carbon emission binder. We have been able to grow in situ uh, fibers as they grow in the, ro in the cement of rocks and faults in, in particular. Uh, the strength and the, um, is equivalent, uh, in some cases better with respect to Portland cement. It's a much uh, more ductile uh, material. And so we are now focusing on the techno-economic analysis, not only cost, but where this rocks uh, is. The future near, really, uh, this is the, the, the pilot that we are going to do and we plan to do, build something on campus that is not a structural uh, element. And so we are working on, uh, with uh, people from development at Stanford to create um, uh, a, a, a small cement job uh, uh, here on campus. And then we are working at the same time uh, for a full-scale implementation with an industrial partner. And with that, I hope I was uh, on time. Uh, I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. That was a great talk. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really interested about the ductility and the failure modes and wonder if in other fibrous compositions, it's already known how to monitor that crack, propagate, crack initiation so that you can then start thinking about uh, avoiding you know, the next earthquake, right? Yeah. Yeah. In other yeah. words, it's great that it will survive the first earthquake, but after those cracks form, it may not survive the second. So how do, how do you imagine monitoring these materials to know when they are near the end of life? Yeah, uh, this is a great question. And uh, we are doing this because um, besides measuring stress and strain, uh, the vessel that I have in my lab is also equipped with acoustic, with the acoustic sensors. So we are monitoring each crack, is each little crack that forms. We are interested in understanding how that 
propagates and coalesces. And so we are doing exactly the same job that seismologists do in mapping earthquakes uh, in the subsurface. And so we are monitor monitoring how with acoustic uh, emission. So at each crack is an acoustic uh, uh, emitter. Uh, and so we can monitor uh, this. So I think it's the low cost um, um, technology to monitor uh, the performance of materials over time. So just follow up, can that be done passive, uh, actively? In other words, not during failure, but can you use acoustic imaging to see it after? A piezoelectric crystal is a piezoelectric crystal. You can use it either to listen, but also to actively excite the piezoelectric crystal and um, 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 propagate waves uh, through uh, the material. So uh, at the end, we measure the velocity of the sound propagation through the medium. Uh, and so we will see whether it's uh, um, um, the properties are deteriorating or uh, stay the same. Thank you for the talk. Um, I'm curious if you've thought about the circularity or reuse that it applied to of this material. Is it more susceptible to reuse recycling the cost you have to pay for it? Wow. Um, to tell you the truth, I didn't think of the circularity because, in my opinion, I've been thinking more how to make it last longer. We have to think that today Portland cement in average um, lasts um, 50, 800 uh, years. Uh, and so that's why we are focused, focusing a lot on ductility and uh, um, uh, making sure that the material also resists to acids. And so that's the reason of using volcanic rocks that by definition uh, have been uh, exposed to high temperature and also um, the um, um, acidic uh, conditions. Uh, in terms of circularity, no, but it's a, a great um, um, question, and, and I will think more about this. Another thing that we are doing, uh, specifically with this material, and I'm working with a former graduate student, um, well, graduate students, it's always a graduate student, but he, she was at Stanford, now she's a professor at UT Austin. Uh, we are looking at the amount of rare element in lithium in this material so that it could be a good collocation. But I will think more about um, uh, circular economy. Thank you. I'm thinking a little bit about concrete and cement. And as I am not a civil engineer, but I understand that the blend that you make you know, is quite different depending on the properties that you want. And I, under, I had understood to reduce the carbon emissions in traditional concrete. The, there were fly ash and other fillers and things you can put into the concrete mix that reduce the amount of cement you need. And I'm curious, for your new material, does the same kind of recipe and blending apply? Is it different in any way or how this works in terms of just using less cement to get the same structural property in the concrete. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this is the reason why I mentioned here that we are also using uh, our cement as a supplementary cementitious material. The role of fly ash or um, um, fume um, um, slag and uh, also pozzolani, normal pozzolanic uh, ash is to reduce the amount of uh, OPC. So I have to mention, I didn't go too much into details, but at the, at the, at the end of the day, our blend is a pozzolanic uh, material. Um, so very similar to the original um, um, pozzolanic ash, uh, which is a vo volcanic um, sediment. Um, in looking, uh, so at the end has the same uh, composition in terms of uh, pozzolanic reactivity. It forms the fibers that I have been showing are fibers of ettringite and tobemerite, which are the typical fibers that form into um, a current uh, Portland cement, which we found uh, um, currently also in faults and also uh, other volcanic uh, environments. So the chemistry has not changed much. It's really the, the earth material, the raw material that is different. So we can use that as a supplementary cementitious material, as you can see here, and the degree of replacement, I have another um, 
uh, plot um, where I compare our material with fly ash and also CL3, which is the new uh, uh, replacement for uh, Portland cement, so mostly using clay. Uh, but um, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it, it can be used, uh, again, as a supplementary cementitious material without changing uh, the composition. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Tiziana. Thank you to all our presenters. Um, three excellent presentations. I'm sorry we ran out of time to have the discussion at the end. I had a whole series of questions for them. I'm sure you did too. But I'm sure they'll be available if you wish to talk to them. And um, thank you again for attending. We'll take a 15-minute break, and then there'll be another session following soon. Thank you. <laughs>